Good morning, and um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thanks so much for open to the Open Preservation Foundation for inviting me. Um, my talk will go about 30, 35 minutes, and I'm hoping we can have some time for discussion after that. Um, but I fully uh, welcome you to please, you know, interrupt me in the chat, ask questions in the chat. I'll be I'll be kind of looking looking there periodically as I go through through the talk. Um, this is kind of a, an altered version of an introduction uh, to uh, digital preservation for moving image and sound that I did as a workshop this summer for the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Network. So um, there's some introductory parts of it. There's some uh, maybe more advanced parts of it. So um, the audience is, is pretty broad. So I'm hoping um, hoping you'll get something out of it. And, and um, I'm really happy you all could be with me today um, in the way that we can be together these days. So uh, just to start off, I wanted to give kind of an overview of where my talk is going to go and where we're going to kind of end up. Um, so I'm going to be going over some commonly found audiovisual materials and cultural heritage collections and um, some going over some tools that are out there, um, mostly web-based tools for identification. I'm going to talk about some common risk factors involved in audiovisual materials in cultural heritage collections. So I'm um, discussing deterioration and um, equipment obsolescence, which are a big issue in our, our subset of our field. Um, and uh, you know, obsolescence of course makes digitization, especially for video and audio a preservation action. You know, it's not just for access. And uh, example specifications for file formats to digitize um, for analog uh, materials and to normalize in the case of um, born digital materials. And uh, some digitization process factors. So um, some questions that you can ask um, yourself in terms of planning. So thinking about whether or not you're going to be doing digitization of audiovisual materials in-house versus whether you would be doing so um, uh, with a vendor. And then I'll be reviewing um, just some very basic metadata for moving image and digital preservation. And since this is focused on moving image and sound materials, I will be focusing on uh, moving image and uh, digital, uh, moving image um, and sound uh, specific uh, metadata schema. So, and I also um, wanted to mention that in the summary for the webinar, I mentioned a published article that I did a few years ago in 2018 about how archivists and technicians um, work together to, um, to help uh, kind of come together uh, to, I interviewed some practitioners around uh, their practice in terms of um, coming together with creating and building this kind of field of work between production and preservation fields um, in the moving image space, but I, timed myself and I don't have time to discuss that, but I am going to include it as a link in the slide. So I'm hoping you'll be able to check that out afterwards if you are if you are interested. And throughout, I'm gonna have resource pages. So um, those point to kind of external sources for follow-up since this is a big topic. Um, I wanted to provide as many resources as I could um, so that you can follow up you know, with um, certain areas that I touch on that you wanted to, to investigate further. All right. So I wanted to start off by just um, kind of reviewing some of the common moving image and sound materials that you'll find in any collection. Um, these uh, may be familiar to you, maybe not familiar to you, um, but I wanted to kind of review what we'll be what we'll be discussing um, here today. So anal some analog examples, right? So um, video, um, NTSC, North America, PAL, CCAM. Those are all. Um, all uh, uh, ISO uh, standards that are that are um, that are specific to the country of where the the video is recorded. Um, I won't get into that in detail, but it's, uh, suffice to say that's important to keep in mind. Um, half inch open reel is one uh, specific uh, uh, videotape uh, format that you'll find often in collections. Um, I worked for a um, digitization vendor for a long time and we, we would get in half inch open reel. We were mostly focused on artist, artist materials and museum specific materials. So um, those uh, half inch open reels were, were very um, at risk even at that point, that was 2010 to 2013. Um, three quarter inch matic, also an at risk, um, an at -risk uh, material. Uh, that's a, 
a, a, a enclosed encased uh, videotape uh, media. Uh, VHS, SVHS, it's probably the most familiar if you're not um, in deep with the audiovisual realm, um, you're probably most familiar with VHS and SVHS, um, at least in, in our country. Um, Betamax is another one. Um, for film, 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, Super 8. Um, 8 millimeter, Super 8, and, and some 16 millimeter are often found in home collections. So um, home movie collections, amateur collections, things like that. So say you got an author's papers or an artist's papers um, into your archive. Um, you know, it's quite common to find to find those materials in with those those um, those materials coming in or the collection, those types of collections coming in. Um, 35 millimeter is most commonly found in production settings. So, um, for example, if you were working for a studio, um, Paramount Studios, for example, you know, they have their own their own um, in-house archive. Um, they have 35 millimeter in their collection a range of different types of, of materials in, ter in terms of generation, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit later. Um, but suffice to say generation is an important term to know I mean, in this kind of area of work. Um, 70 millimeter is another one um, that's more rare. Uh, that was kind of a, a short-lived uh, but very beautiful uh, uh, film gauge uh, that you would find in, in a collection. So it's, it's very large and has its own projector system and things like that. Audio, so quarter inch open reel is very common. Um, there, were, there were home machines of that available um, that there's also, um, there's also a, a thing called a Nagra, which is a, a recording device um, that people use to um, record sound um, when they were doing like independent productions or doing field recordings, oral histories, things like that for, for quite a few number of years. Audio cassette, micro, micro cassette, digital examples. So I wanted to include some, um, some examples of physical media that aren't analog in nature. So these are digital materials that are very common in collections found in you know, the late 1990s, 2000s, things like that. So DV cam, uh, DV, mini DV. Mini DV, you'll find a metal evaporate, um, which is a high risk for flaking and dropout. Um, we'll discuss that a bit later. DVD, DVD-R. Um, for audio, you can find DAT tapes in a lot of collections. Uh, mini disc, CD, and CDR. Yeah, half inch open reel, very common in professional AV. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was very common in the 70s, um, especially with uh, you know independent independent news um, productions, things like that, because it was it was actually portable, so people could walk around with it, which wasn't the norm in that time. So, and the and of course, videotape is much cheaper to produce than film. So. Um, that was a, a, a very uh, interesting era for that, that medium. All right, so I'm going to go into um, some images of film and video, just so you have kind of an idea of what you're, what you're looking at when you in confront these, um, these materials in your collections. Um, so film, film is uh, obviously, you know, this, what you see right here. <laughs> You can see here in the 35 millimeter image, the example that we have here, there is no soundtrack, but you can often find prints. They're called prints that are that are that have a soundtrack on the side here. Um, 16 millimeter has this um, optical soundtrack, which is uh, where you have wavy lines and dark and light areas. Um, you can also find magnetic soundtracks, which are a um, strip of of uh, magnetic. Uh, it looks like tape, but it's not tape <laughs> exactly um, on the side here. And that's read by a magnetic, um, a particular type of, of projector. So this in, in particular is, is called a print because it includes the sound in the picture. Um, this I would imagine would be either a camera original or a negative. So this is something that hasn't been yet merged with the, the, the sound. Um, eight millimeter and super eight, it's often, you will often find materials that are silent. And these are often found in amateur and home movie collections. Um, you can see that eight millimeter has a larger sprocket hole. And those, those are the same size as 16 millimeter sprocket holes. Um, of course, they won't. You, you can't um, you know, project uh, eight millimeter uh, on a 16 millimeter uh, projector, but you can 
uh, see that they they are they are very similar in, in nature. So they're actually split when the when the when the film is is um, is uh, uh, processed by the lab. It's actually split into the two eight millimeter styles. So and you you flip it over in the camera to produce it. Um, so I'll just note too that it is it is somewhat um, important and something that you might want to consider um, going after uh, some uh, knowledge of production based uh, production in the in the, doing this kind of work because it helps you kind of understand the process and where where along the flow of arc of the of the of the um, the piece or arc of the the artwork or the actual uh, material that you're working with to see you know kind of what the quality is what you want to preserve and and do your your kind of accessioning process so if you're in an archive but of course museums a bit different um i wanted to mention too that there are different types of film stock so polyester stock is the type of film stock that's produced today and it's been produced since around the 1970s i'd say maybe the 1980s um, and it's it's very durable, so that is what um, is used for film to film preservation, um, which is still very common these days. Except um, a lot of archives are now scanning uh, film because of um, new distribution techniques involved in um, you know the you see you know digital projection everywhere, right? I, at least in the United States, we see um, digital projection um, very commonly in in movie theaters and even in you know older theaters that do revival by revival screenings. So um, you would see, you would see even, you know, in a restoration, a DCP coming out of that, which is a DCP is the type of distribution um, channel that's uh, the alternative to a print, <laughs> a film print. So um, polyester stock, I got off on a little tangent there. <laughs> um, acetate is another, it's another type of, of material that is used in producing manufacturing film. Um, and that was used up until like the 1990s, I'd say, you know, it's a, you, you still see it in the 2000s, but not as commonly. Um, and that is prone to vinegar syndrome. Um, and nitrate is another one. Nit vinegar syndrome is another type of degradation for, for film. Um, nitrate is uh, another type of material that you'll find with film. Um, it's less common than acetate or polyester. Um, that was produced before the 1960s and it's flammable. It's incredibly beautiful, but you need a certification to project it. It's very, um, it's very uh, hazardous. So um, there are some regulations in our, in our subset of the industry for that. Uh, for that type, particular type of, of medium. So it's, it's very, very flammable. Um, and it was only produced up until the 1960s. So um, that's hopefully useful information for you to know. Um, all right. And so I wanted to just mention too quickly the kind of group of elements um, and generation. Um, I would recommend a book by Lenny Lipton um, called Independent Filmmaking, which really goes into details about the production process for um, for filmmaking and gives kind of a hands-on view of what you know a, a like say a master is a camera original work print. Um, it gives you a sense of what the what the production process is, so you can understand um, kind of the background of of where a filmmaker might have been coming from. Um, master is kind of a, a term that's not um, encouraged in use these days. Um, a lot of people are using um, other terms like like uh, central or things like that because it have the connotations with master has but you will find that term and submaster on um, archival materials so it's important to know I think. All right, I'm going to move over to the next slide. Um, so video half inch open reel we already discussed a little bit. Um, this is a uh, guide. This is called the. Um, videotape identification and assessment guide. And this will be in the link with the slides as well. Um, so I'm going to just quickly um, share with you uh, a little a little peek at this at, at this um, resource because it's so useful. It was it was made in 2004. However, it is um, one of these uh, one of these resources that I never stop using as a consultant working in audiovisual collections.
oh well all right it's not it's not behaving so <laughs> this will be in the in the resource for you um so so suffice to say this is um basically the format of that identification guide so it gives you the um a really broad overview of of videotape materials that are out there in all sorts of different collections it includes digital and analog so you know you'd have mini db examples you have d1 examples which is a very not less common format um, in, in digital uh, tape-based media. Um, and Half Inch Open Reel is one example of an analog, um, an analog uh, version of this. So this gives you, you know, the real dimensions, the tape container, photographs. Um, it also gives you risk factors, including equipment obsolescence, which is at this point just across the board um, an issue. So um, of course, because everything is, uh, or most things now nowadays are digital. So uh, you can see a lot of, of the material that you'll find in your collection in this guide. So it's, it's incredibly useful and I'd highly encourage you to, to take a look at it. Um, so um, when I say obsolescence, I just wanna go over that term a bit. Um, the idea is that Equipment obsolescence, uh, manufacturers of videotape playback decks haven't been manufacturing them for many, many years. So for example, pneumatic, tech, pneumatic decks haven't been produ produced in, since, the, since the 1990s. So those, um, those uh, playback equipment decks are very rare and especially in professional usage. So you know, we wanna be able to capture all that we can as audiovisual archivists, we wanna be able to um, get the highest quality. Um, we want to have a reliable machine that, that works for us. Um, and so oftentimes what we would do in that case is go to um, video engineers or people who refurbish uh, decks. And I have a slide in the end that gives you um, some resources for people who do that work still in the United States. Um, I'm not as familiar, unfortunately, with um, those who are in Europe and around the world, but um, this gives you kind of a sense of, of what that is. So I wanted to mention that. I'm happy to discuss it in the Q&A as well. Um, okay, moving on. Um, this is another very basic um, kind of like uh, conservation action that you can do is to um, remove the record button. Um, and this is just something that, that audiovisual archivists do when we get tapes into a collection immediately, because this allows you to not record over the material once it's being digitized. So it's really important to do that before you send it out to a vendor or do your own digitization work. All right, and I wanted to give a shout out to the Preservation Self-Assessment Program Collection ID Guide. This is another um, very, very useful um, tool for identifying, especially audio. Um, this gives you photographs, pictures, um, gives you an idea of what you're looking at. So um, this can be very useful. And I wanted to mention too that audio can really come in groups. So different tracks can be recorded on separate physical media. Um, you can look at the markings on the tape. You can research the history of the production. Um, Consider if it makes sense to, you know, master to one file if you have multiple recordings um, in it, or if the master is somehow lost um, and also to take keep track of the inches per second. So that's another thing that the vendor will want to know or if you're in house, that's something you would need to know um, if you were doing digitization. And it's often noted on the housing. So this is an example of quarter inch audio. And this is an example of audio cassette. Right. Um, so digitization priorities and risk factors went over this a bit. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail um, for some of these, but um, I would say that that a really important step is um, just basic inventory and accession on an item level because audiovisual materials are often in, like I said, those groupings. Right. So we have, you know, the, the master, the submaster, the edit master, things like that. Um, you're going to want to know what the individual thing is that you're looking at and what um, has come after it, right? So if you have a camera original that couldn't contain unique footage, right, that, that didn't make it into the final edit. So, um, so that's something to consider. Um, and that, that's something that can, depending on the, how organized the artist or the filmmaker was, um, can be very, very tricky, or it can be very clear cut and, and, and easy. So um, that's just something to, to kind of keep in mind there. 
All right. So um, identification, evaluation, and inspection, like I said, these two guides are very, very useful for that. Um, the preservation self-assessment program also includes film. So if you need, need photographs for that, that can be also useful. Um, analog video, um, I would say it's important to prioritize that based on age and condition. So um, like we said before, equipment obsolescence is a big factor. Um, sticky shed syndrome is one that we saw a lot where I worked at a dig digitization lab. Um, that is a, um, a deterioration that's basically the binder of the, of the video where the, the actual oxide um, that's recorded onto where the signal lies, um, the kind of goop or <laughs> the kind of uh, thing that makes it so it's attached to the, the carrier um, that can uh, become unstable over time. So it depends on really the manufacturer, it depends on the age, it depends, has a lot of different factors. Um, there's not a lot of funding for doing research in this area, so there isn't a lot that I can say uh, matter-of-factly about you know, what is most at risk, but um, we saw a lot when I worked at, I worked at Bay Area Video Coalition for years and, and we would see a lot of tapes from the late 1970s and early 80s that had this and they were especially at risk. Um, and, and, and like I said, with um, half inch open reel, it's another, another factor. So um, some of the, the ways to mitigate this is um, by treatment. So conservation treatment, which includes um, baking a tape, which, um, is uh, something that Bayvac would do because they had a they had a de dehydrator, a professional dehydrator, um, and there was specific times that we would u utilize in order to make that happen. And I wouldn't recommend that on a on in in a non uh, vendor specific uh, arena um, unless you're already comfortable with you have someone already training you um, on that. So um, so yeah, so I wanted to mention that um, analog audio. So again, this is an, a similar a similar risk factors with audio and video. They're often um, made up of the same material, um, although audio um, sometimes can include polyester based um, uh, carrier. So that's another factor there. Tape based digital media. So DAT, DV, mini DV, like we mentioned before. Um, equipment obsolescence is another issue with this, um, especially with DAT tapes. Um, uh, a lot of the time I would hear anecdotally that people wouldn't be able to digitize DAT on one, one um, recording device versus another um, years later. So DAT is a really important one to prioritize. Um, mini DV, like I said, with the metal evaporate, if it has, has ME on it, it is at risk. So uh, if that's an important, important uh, material to be digitized immediately. Um, film is one of the one of the ones, <laughs> one of the types of material that is actually, you know, has fewer risk factors, in my opinion, um, especially if it's uh, polyester, though you do want to keep an eye out for vinegar syndrome and acetate film because it does spread. So it's important to isolate any materials that you have that has a vinegar scent to it. Um, where you're getting a collection in, important to smell the video, the, smell the smell the film, um, to make sure that you don't you don't have that and you can isolate it. Um, of course, flammability for nitrate, like we said, and brittleness and breaking is another one, depending on the kind of humidity levels, temperature, humidity control that was that was utilized um, in its previous life. Optical media is another that's at risk, um, and some of these risks include scratching. Um, dive, dive fading from recordable discs. So, um, you know, if you expose a CDR or a DVDR to light, it's very common that it will fade and the, um, the actual uh, uh, recording that is uh, placed on it with dye is then um, rendered moot, it it's disappears. So it's really important to keep that in a dark place, um, DVDRs and CDRs. I would recommend to um, to not not actually write on the DVD or CD um, because the ink can seep through. Um, it's really uh, uh, most archives that I have encountered and and in myself in my experience we will write or um, have a label that's recorded in the in the middle of the the very the clear middle of a CD or DVDR. Okay. 
So moving on, um, I just wanted to give a really quick, um, this is uh, thanks to the, the uh, CLEAR Foundation, the CLEAR um, Council and Library and Information Resources for their, um, for this image. Um, it's a, a common one if we're in the audiovisual archiving world, it's been around for a while, but it's, it's really useful to see um, where uh, the binder is. So binder is really what, what becomes um, the sticky shed syndrome, right? So with um, material like that, that is being recorded on a video or an audio, and you have that in your, in your archive, um, it's very important to, to keep an eye out for this. So. All right, so um, I wanted to include some digitization kind of techniques and uh, example specification. This is very basic, so it really depends on your context and where you're coming from regarding this. So um, I would say that uh, for video and audio, it's often you'll have the analog playback deck, right? So you have a, a playback deck that you that you um, know is in good shape. You've bought it from a, a trusted vendor or you have sent it out to a um, to be refurbished or, or looked at by a video engineer. Um, you have a capture card and cables. Um, a common a common vendor, at least here in the United States, is Blackmagic um, for for this type of, of usage. Um, capture software um, that can be Final Cut Pro, Premiere, Adobe Premiere, or um, you know even your just your default uh, software that comes with the capture card. So Blackmagic also has a um, software tool that they use that's very basic for this type of purpose um, and to the hard drive. So that's kind of like the general workflow. Um, for digital media, media um, especially for DV, DV files in themselves as, as, as captured files are actually very common and not, um, not uh, considered to be at risk um, as, as, the, as the actual like physical media of DV. So um, you can see that you have a Fireware USB that's attached to like a camera or a playback deck. This is also in same similar situation where you have a playback deck or a camera that you're reli reliable and trustworthy. Um, it goes into the capture software and hard drive. So you have settings within that capture software that you can set to make sure that you have, okay, I have a, you know, a, a, a the quality that I want and the file format that I want that's set in that software. So I'm just going to check the chat really quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so uh, recommendations for specific Blackmagic products. Yeah, so I would say um, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't know off the top of my head, but um, but I'd be happy to to get back to you about that or yeah if anyone else has any recommendations for for black magic that would be great um i recommend to you like the association moving image archivist listserv um that's one where you can ask these types of questions and have a whole slew of people who have that that background and experience that are very generous with their knowledge so okay and then um example target formats so um california revealed is a project that um it's been around for for a number of years, uh, I think about 10 years, and they they work to digitize materials from smaller historical societies, um, from organizations that don't have, um, you know, archives themselves, but want to be included in this in this um, this project that's um, administered now by the state of California State Archives. So they have a statement of work for um, audiovisual materials, which gives a, um, a specification for oops specification for um, the different types of um, file formats and quality level that they want out of the out of that uh, particular file. So um, this link will be in your in the slides which we'll share after but um, but these uh, kind of give you a sense of of uh, what the what the idea is with when they're um, doing digitization what they want to get out of it. So, it's really useful for if you're doing a planning on your on a project to digitize materials um, and what you what you want to get out of that. So um, you can see digital audio recordings. Um, what what do you request from the vendor? What technical specifications do you want to ask for? Um, broadcast wave is a very common target target format, and it's it's very good. So it's a very commonly used, and it it is 
Um, the YA, if anyone's familiar with the YASA organization, the International Archives and Sound Association, um, they do a lot of really great um, file format standardization work. And they, the TCO4 is where that specification is documented. And um, I'd really recommend taking a look at that if you're at all interested in this technical, technical side of things, um, because they have a really good explanation of, of why, why wave format and what, why PCM, things like that. Access file. So the access file is, you know, what you would put on the web or what you would put on, um, you know, a, a smaller derivative file that's not, you know, the highest quality, but it's something that you can actually share with people over the internet or on a website. Um, so this gives you a sense of what their what their standards are. This might depend on what your platform is that you're using. And then uh, it goes on from there. So it, it gives you an analog access format, um, digital video recordings, things like that. So optical disc, um, for optical disc, they want a disc image and a wrapper. And, um, and then of course, once that disc image is, is, is captured, then they'll expand on it and they'll They'll extract the disk image and, and see what's on it. So if there's a video, if there's video or audio on it, then you normalize to this material. And film recordings. So um, if you're going to be digitizing material to film, um, this is the specification that they would ask for. So I think it's just useful to, to be able to see that um, when you're you know doing a doing a project to see what other people are doing. Um, I think can be really useful um, in the you know community mindset. So. All right, so I'm going to go quickly. I think I'm running out of the time here, but um, let's see. Let me check the chat very quickly. Broadcast wave is not different than a wave file, um, but it depends on what the the codec is. So PCM is the codec, and the broadcast wave file is kind of like the wrapper. Um, and it, yeah, you can embed metadata. Thank you, Rito. <laughs> oh, thank you for the links. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Catherine. That's wonderful. FIAF is a great organization for um, looking, at, looking at film as well. Um, they're very institutionally based. So um, they have a lot of like workshops, formal workshops, things like that. I'd say as far as, you know, looking at individuals and, and you know, looking at people, like talking to people individually, I'd say EMEA, the list service can be very useful as well. So yeah, all right, great. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just show um, some digitization techniques um, and uh, of course the specifications. So these are some example specifications from Bay Area Video Coalition, which is a vendor that uses you know, kind of the standard practice these days are very involved in community, um, community standardization and things like that. Um, again, broadcast wave, and that's, you know, yeah, dot WAV is another, another, uh, that's the extension used for that. So. All right, and so I wanted to just um, provide some of some lists of questions to ask for vendors. Um, so you know, I think it's important to, to look for referrals from audiovisual archivists that you are your colleagues. Um, I think it can be useful to um, think about what formats they can handle, what experience they have, um, what is their knowledge about digitization in terms of looking for deterioration? Do they have experience doing that? Um, there are some vendors that deal specifically with mold remediation. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, Specs Brothers is one of those. I don't know if they're still in business, but that, that's one in the kind of New York area in the, in the United States. Um, but that's another thing to consider if you do have a, a mold issue. Uh, it's very important to send that out. Um, insurance to cover material while in their possession, if that's something that's important to you. Um, how originals will be stored while they're in their possession, things like that. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but and then uh, I wanted to, to move on. So we don't, we'll have time for questions um, at the end. So in-house, so questions to ask. Um, 
so this is if you are interested in doing it yourself. Um, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of audiovisual archivists are technically minded and they have um, some experience with say production or film filmmaking. Um, you know, there might be some person in your on staff who has some IT experience or is interested in it. Um, and I, you know, I'd really encourage you to, to think through this, these questions and to, to consider that as an option. Um, and there's a really useful, um, a really useful uh, document that was created, I think about like maybe three or four years ago, but it's, I think it's pretty much up to date. Um, it's uh, called the minimum viable digitization, uh, state, uh, visual, minimal viable digitization document. And I think it was created by Ashley Bluer, um, but it was contributed to by audiovisual archivists all over. And I know that I have this in, <laughs> in here somewhere, but um, suffice to say, it's a very useful, a document that kind of goes through what it means to create a do-it-yourself um, digitization station, especially for video and audio. And this is another resource page. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, different types of, 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 of resources that will help you. Oh, this is the, this is the minimum viable digitization station. So you can see here, that's the resource I was talking about before. Um, so this is another, um, these are some links to video playback deck vendors. AV Artifact Atlas is another really useful resource. This is something that you can look at to see if you get a tape back from your vendor and it, it looks funny. There's some sort of like error in it. You can say, look at the Art AV Artifact Atlas and say, okay, you know, is this something that's, that I can, they can do something about, or if it's just inherent in the, me in the media. So, really useful community resource. Um, this is also another article by a colleague of mine, Dinah Handel, um, that, that gives kind of like an overview of microservices. So little scripts that you can run um, to help facilitate digital preservation um, once you get the files back um, and that kind of thing. So post digitization or born digital. So a lot of a lot of the you know kind of digitization digital preservation process happens in the analog to digital or digital physical media to to file um, process. So I wanted to be sure and mention some of the um, format identification tools that are out there. Um, some of these are very particular to audiovisual, and some of them are not. Um, and not to say that you know Droid or Siegfried cannot handle audiovisual. It's that it's perfectly um, possible that they do, but Media Info and FF Probe, um, especially those are the ones I have the most experience with, those provide a lot of information about a file, um, and I encourage you to check those out. All right, so there's another resource page. Um, this kind of has to do with storage. So this can be a big issue with audiovisual material because files are very high resolution oftentimes, and they're, you know, it's very common to use 10-bit uncompressed as a, as a preservation target format. Um, FFE1 is a losslessly compressed um, codec that's being used more and more these days. And that, that gives you um, kind of like that, what I said before about compression. So it, it compresses the file and makes it a little bit easier to, um, to store um, in an affordable way. Um, but these give you kind of like a, these resources give you kind of like a way in for, for storage and, and for resources for that. All right, and software for digital preservation. Um, these are some of the commonly used um, software tools um, to facilitate digital preservation. All of these are different. They have different um, aspects to them. I don't, I can't go into them today, but I wanted to be sure and mention them. Um, the collection management system collection, this is another um, kind of like community-based resource that was um, initiated by Ashley Bluer. <laughs> um, and so this is a, this also gives you a sense of what collection management systems are out there. Some of these have nothing to do with digital preservation. Some of them are just cataloging, um, a ways to catalog and cataloging software, but some of them are, that are, are digital asset management systems or systems where, you know, DSpace or Preservica, they have like some evaluation by the community in there. All right, so I'm just going to go quickly into preservation metadata. Um, for PB, PB Core is the most commonly used um, uh, metadata schema for materials that are in audiovisual collections, and it's it's mostly maintained. It's maintained by the GBH Media Library and Archives, but it also um, I should mention too that it's um, has specifically to do with public media. So it was based in 
kind of like a public media um, workflow. So like what I talked about before with film, knowing filmmaking and knowing that process, they, this data model gives you kind of a sense of, of okay, this is, this is really where you're coming from with, uh, with a material. So if, if it's an amateur film collection, for example, versus a public media collection, you might have a different, a different way of working with it and a different kind of way of wanting to do the data model yourself. But it is quite flexible, um, and I'd encourage you to check it out. And the, the link here gives you a data model visual, which I think can be really useful. All right. So I don't know how much time we have left for questions, but I'm happy to take any questions there might be. Um, and you can put those in the chat. Aside from insurance, how can you mitigate risk of loss or damage when sending unique originals to a vendor? That's a great question, Michael. Um, you know, I would say that um, it's important to package up the material in a in a very particular way. So I'm, you know, in a very careful way. Um, I would consider the idea that with video and audio in particular, or, or tape-based media, that you don't want to have paper flakes, like sometimes with cardboard or with with um with a smaller, you know, packing material that that can flake off, that can become entrapped into the, the actual tape case and can damage the film. So I'd really encourage you to use like those, um, you know, plastic bubble or something that's, you know, maybe more environmentally friendly that um, that uh, is is uh, less likely to flake off. Um, so and then also just securing it very securely, um, you know, some well uh, well resourced institutions can hire, you know, art handlers or art shippers, packers. Um, that's an, another option if you're if it's something that's really um, of a concern to you. So. With irreplaceable materials, and my Anna asks, and with irreplaceable materials, it might be cheaper and safer to get a driver to deliver it directly instead of shipping and insurance. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I would say don't let that be a barrier though, in order to get something digitized, because a lot of the time, you know, people kind of hold on to things very tightly. And I'd say that, you know, having something digitized really um, increases the access, it increases the likelihood that that material can survive over time. So if you have a um, tape that is from the 1970s, from the 1980s, really important to get it digitized, especially if it's video, audio, you know, very important. Um, Rachel says, we do midweek overnight shipping to make sure it doesn't sit in transit over a weekend. Great idea. Yes, that is a, a very good thought. Um, if you have the resources to do overnight shipping, beautiful. Yeah. And Sheena says, agree, lucky enough to be able to drive items to Glasgow Film and Sound Archive without packing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, Martin says, contractual agreements with triggers for when the vendor needs to let you know of problems in QC on receiving and our key. Yes, absolutely. Um, we had a process at BayVac where a Bay Area Video Coalition where we would kind of um, evaluate the material as it came in. Um, and be sure to mark off kind of like what we saw when we when we got the materials in and we're able to report that back to the to the client. Um, Eric says after digitization, what is the recommended che recommendation check some software in checking the integrity of the digitized files versus preserve archive files. Great question. So it really depends on your um, individual system. So if you're running Windows or Mac. Um, you know, a lot of the a Mac software, um, in particular, if you're working on a desktop or you're working on a, a larger server situation, um, there are, uh, there's a Python uh, Bagot um, schema, um, Python Bagot, uh, and I can, I can, um, if you want to follow up with me, I can, I have my email in the next slide. Um, you can follow up with me about that if you want to email me and I can send you a, a link to the GitHub about that. Um, but uh, so it depends on kind of like your level of technical ability, um, really. But a lot of the time you can with um, a Mac, you can check a checksum MD5 or SHA, SHA-256, SHA, uh, the different types of SHA, SHA hash algorithms. 
um, on your individual computer. So, and it can be quite easy and it's, it's something that um, you'd have to have a little familiarity with the command line interface in order to do that. But, you know, that's, an, that's one option. So I can't, I can't advise you, unfortunately, like in particular, but very particular situation, but, um, but yeah, I'd recommend, you know, checking checksums when you get it in and, and um, thinking about that for sure. Okay, so Tan asks, if analog recording only has one mono track, do we digitize it as one track or two tracks for the digitized file? That's a great question. Um, so if, if our analog recording has one mono track um, and it says that it's mono and you, can you feel like you can trust it, then I would say digitize it to one file. Um, it really depends on the workflow though. It's very individual to the archive. Um, and it depends on, you know, if there are, if there's one mono that has the same name and then another mono track that has another name that says overlay or something like that, it really, it, it, it is complicated, but, um, and, and I don't mean to make it complicated, but um, just getting it digitized is kind of like the first step. And so if it is a mono track and it's one, one element, I would say digitize it to one file. Um, you can also digitize things, um, say if you have two elements that are, you're not, you're not, you're not sure whether or not they're, um, you know, stereo or mono, and you can digitize them and see what you get out of it and you can listen to it. Um, some vendors will also let you co go into their facility and work with them individually around that. So that can be another option. Hopefully that's helpful. What AV materials need priority to change to digital preservation, audio cassettes, Super 8, 16 video, or CD and hard drive in that row. Um, so I would say that um, in my opinion, uh, video is uh, older video, especially half inch open reel, umatic. Um, those are at high risk for deterioration and equipment lapse lessons. So um, you know, I, I think about those two factors in Congress when you're when you're trying to kind of plan out the different um, priorities that you have for digitization. Um, in my opinion, Super 8, 16, you know, those can last quite a while unless they're, unless they have vinegar syndrome, in which case I would say digitize them when you can. Um, and then CD and DVD, you know, like I said, DVD-R, CD-R, if they have the dye layer, which I think is, I believe is kind of like a blue green tinge to a, to a CD. You can kind of see it in the light. Um, if that is the case, then I would say that digitizing that is, should be a priority as well especially if you can't keep it in the dark. All right, Mickey asks, can you say something about why BAVAC doesn't use MKV FFE1 as a target wrapper format for video, but just for film? Um, so, huh, that's a good question. So I no longer work for BAVAC, so I can't speak for them, um, but they do have the option for using FFE1 in MKV wrapper. Um, and I think it depends on the individual um, individual vendor that they're using. And I think that because of uh, my my guess is that because FFE one and MKV are pretty new to the field of of production, and they maybe work with documentaries, they maybe work with people who are utilizing the material in different ways that aren't you know long term preservation. Um, it might be that they want. Uh, that 10 bit uncompressed files um, to be the, the master um, in an MOV. And that can be something that can be worked with perhaps with the client's um, existing context. Hopefully that answers the question. Oh, by row, I meant order. Okay. Yeah, that's I, it, it's, I, I think I answered that, um, but I'm, I'm hoping, hopefully, you can follow up if, if not, that meant, if that doesn't make any sense. All right, Sarit asks, once digitized, some of the original materials can never be replayed to my knowledge. Is it necessary to save them? Is the original carrier important or just the content? Um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. It's something that's debated in our field um, quite a lot. Um, if you, I would say if you, my personal opinion is if you have the resources to keep it, you should keep it because there can be, you know, ebb techniques down the line that, um, you know, it's kind of like a backup, really. You can kind of think about it as um, the original analog as a backup in that way. So if you have a hard drive fail, you have, you maybe have, don't have the resources to, to have another hard drive that's in another geographic location, you have an earthquake, something like that, and, a, you know, two hard drives fail, then you have that analog backup um, that you can then digitize to, um, digitize from, 
um, that's kind of like a, an, extra, an extra safety measure. And um, once digitized, some of original materials can never be replayed. That's true for things that are quite deteriorated, I'd say, um, or if the equipment obsolescence is to an extreme degree. Um, but we still do have vendors out there who will uh, digitize material at this point. So, you know, kind of like it's like kind of a historical line marker, right? You're kind of like looking into the future and thinking, okay, in 10 years from now, will this be existing? Maybe not. So I want to digitize it immediately. But it doesn't mean that it can't be replayed. It's just a risk factor. So it is possible that it can't be replayed. <laughs> All right, so Anna asks, says, um, also, I think it can be useful to work with other similar organizations to pull resources for digitization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for storage centers, funding applications, um, find a common theme to collections in different institutions. Absolutely. Equipment, collection display portals, it really helps too to have a community around technical, technical knowledge and really like being able to talk through things with your colleagues is just hugely important, I think. And, one thing that's I think actually good about you know the Zoom culture that we have right now is that we can keep groups like international groups that are that are able to talk to one another and talk through these kinds of things. Um, it seems, and she says again, it seems smaller archives often work too much in isolation for this type of work and miss out on opportunities and get overwhelmed. Absolutely, yeah, uh, that is so key. I'm really glad you brought that up, Anna. Um, Tan asks, may I know how is the climactic environmental chamber relevant to audiovisual preservation at what stage? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are some specifications out there for, um, for relative humidity and temperature control. Um, it depends on, you know, if it's film or video, um, what, you're, what you're working with. However, uh, in my personal opinion, with video and audio, if it's analog, it just needs to be digitized. So <laughs> really like rehousing or paying attention to, um, you know, in the meantime, of course, it's important to keep, keep, a, uh, uh, keep an eye on, you know, the, the, the temperature and humidity, of course, of course, but, you know, if you can, but really the most important thing for um, especially materials that are from the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, to, to have those be digitized is really the most um, critical conservation action that you can do. Um, and I'd say that too, you know, um, some people include um, have remediation treatments, like I said, with baking the tape. There's also um, some efforts around um, that people have used from, there's an image permanence institute in the United States, uh, then Rochester, and they might be something, something where you might want to look at their their website and resources. Um, they have a lot of, of, of resources pertaining to relative humidity and, and, and uh, temperature control um, that really gives you a, a sense of what, what might be a, a good way to go with that. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Great. Um, so I think that about brings us to the end of our time. Um, I just want to say a really big thank you uh, to you, Lauren, for such an engaging presentation. Um, it's been really great to hear some kind of practical examples and get some uh, kind of specific best practices um, for the audience to take away from them. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to everyone else as well. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is um, our final webinar for 2021, um, but we already have some events lined up for the new year. So please do kind of visit the OPF website and, and see some information about those. And in the meantime, I hope you all have a, a great break and a happy new year. And yeah, thank you again, Lauren. It's been really great to hear from you today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>